Hi, this is Matthew Robert Payne, and uh, this is going to be uh, my hardest book ever. And so this uh, video, if you've tuned into this video, my head will go funny with this Zoom video. This is a, a makeup background and it makes my head go funny and stuff. Please excuse that. Um, so this is uh, something uh, the Holy Spirit called me to and uh, I've got a scribe angel that gives me titles for books and um, the title of this book is going to be called um, uh, uh, Stop Throwing Stones, The Anatomy of a Christian Sex Addict and uh, you should have that as the title of this video. Um, I'm going to hope to uh, do uh, bookmarks uh, through this video uh, that uh, can uh, list the subjects in chapter titles uh, in the description tag of the, of the video, um, hopefully to have timestamps in there. So you can just skip ahead and look at a chapter or if you've watched the whole video, uh, for you just to skip ahead and read that chapter or listen to that chapter. Um, uh, so uh, you want to review points. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, it takes effort. It takes about a $1,000 uh, for me to produce a book and I've got money to be able to do that. Uh, this is very hard to do. Um, and I'll share this because I've got a reputation in the Christian circles and uh, it takes a lot of humility to go ahead and do this, especially when I haven't got answers at the moment. Um, but uh, I'm doing it for the single person that watches this video. Um, if you're a person who's got a sex addiction, who's addicted to prostitutes or addicted to pornography, uh, I'm compelled to do this video and compelled to do this book for you. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a handle on your sex addiction at the moment. You don't necessarily have to have the answer. And I think this uh, video and this book will be very helpful uh, for people who are still caught in those addictions. Um, and uh, that's why the Holy Spirit is compelling me to come forward and say this, that uh, as of uh, the 11th of March 2021, uh, Matthew Robert Payne is still a sex addict. And uh, so I'm doing it for you uh, in this brief introduction. Uh, I'm doing it for myself because the Holy Spirit has told me to do it. And part of the process of repentance is to confess our sins one to another. And this is my uh, public confession of my sin and the thing that's weighing me down. And I hope that uh, this very public uh, confession uh, will, will help uh, many of the people who are listening to this video and eventually reading the book that will come from it. Um, I say right at the beginning, I, I haven't got answers. I've, I've got some understanding of what my answer could be, but I'm not currently healed and I'm not currently free of this addiction. And uh, so I uh, just put a disclaimer on this, uh, on this video and the book that will come from it, that uh, this isn't a book about answers. This isn't a book about uh, how to get free uh, because I haven't worked that out myself yet. So we'll start with chapter one. I've got uh, 21 uh, titles of chapters and uh, I'll just work through them. Uh, once again, uh, if you haven't read any of my books, um, I don't tend to speak too much. I, I don't feel that um, I have to over say things or, or fill up a book. Uh, if this uh, 21 points gets covered in an hour, that's good. If it takes two hours or three hours, that's fine. Um, so I don't mind how little it is. I don't mind how long it is. Um, you know, as long as the book is over 20 pages, people will download it on Kindle. 
so um, I, I, I've got uh, 3,000 videos and uh, I'm very much led by the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit puts the words into my mouth. And uh, so um, I'm sitting here and like I've taken a back seat now and the Holy Spirit is using my voice and my stories and my recollections. And he's actually speaking through me. Actually, it's uh, my scribe angel who's uh, speaking through me and she's led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so you can see me in my T-shirt um, and, and uh, I'm speaking, but uh, the inspiration for what I'm saying is coming from another source. And so I hand myself over to that um, and, uh, and I'll just let them speak. So the first chapter, uh, and it should be in the uh, description tag as a tagged um, uh, chapter, um, so the first one will be introduction, and this first one is going to be um, meeting Jesus. So I was eight years of age, <coughs> and uh, we we had a cat in our family, and uh, the cat uh, died. I think it was run over by a car, and uh, it really broke my heart because this cat was... Um, personal friend of mine uh, used to come into my bedroom and I used to be sad. I had a, a father that uh, believed in discipline and was quite a violent father and uh, had a older brother who, who used to pick on me and uh, do me violence. And uh, so I was a sad little boy, you know, I had sadness and uh, I remember, uh, uh, you know, being in my room and crying and talking to my cat. My cat used to understand me. My cat was my friend. And when I lost my cat, it broke my heart. And uh, around that time, uh, they, they had, well, for six months, my, my parents hadn't replaced the cat because they wanted uh, me to finish my grieving uh, before they replaced the cat. And... Uh, so uh, this uh, evangelist, which, uh, which uh, if you're not a Christian watching this video, not a Christian reading this book, an evangelist is someone whose job it is to present the Christian uh, message and Jesus as a saviour uh, to people and uh, have them uh, become a Christian. And so we had this children's evangelist. It's the only time I've ever met one. Uh, he came to our church and so after school we were taken to church and uh, this Christian evangelist talked about how you can have a special friend uh, called Jesus and he will be your special friend and be with you and he'll never leave you. He'll always be with you and you can talk to him and be really close to him. And because I'd lost my cat, um, I was in the market <laughs> for a special friend and uh, it was particularly comforting that he said, uh, this special friend will never leave you because my cat had left me. And uh, so uh, he asked uh, any of the boys and girls uh, if they wanted to accept Jesus uh, to, to come forward. This is before they told you to put up your hand and get you committed and then call you to come forward after you've put up your hand. Uh, this, this, they used to do altar calls where they just said, come forward if you, you want to receive uh, Jesus as your special friend. And I come forward and invited Jesus into my heart as an eight-year-old boy, an innocent uh, boy. And uh, so that was happening. Um, I quickly developed an ability to hear Jesus. Um, uh, we uh, had uh, song books back in those times called Scripture in Song. And uh, what they used to be is um, Psalms and Proverbs and different scriptures in the Bible are uh, put to music. But if you actually looked up the chorus uh, in the Bible, it was word for word of the Bible. It was just basically scripture verses uh, put to music. 
And uh, one of the early ways Jesus used to talk to me, I, I'd be feeling down or, or upset. And uh, one of the scripture and songs, songs used to play in my heart. And that used to be a scriptural answer uh, to, um, to my thought. And uh, uh, so uh, scripture and songs, used to play to me and uh, it was the way that Jesus could communicate with me. Another way, um, each week, uh, my mother was a Christian and uh, each week we, we had a thing called a memory verse and we had to uh, memorize a different scripture verse every week. And my mother would hang it on the vanity in, in the bathroom, on, on the bathroom mirror. And uh, every time we brushed our teeth in the morning, we'd read the verse. And at the end of um, the week, we used to have to quote the verse and the scripture reference. And uh, if we didn't do that, we didn't get our pocket money. We didn't get our allowance for the week. And um, over the years, those scriptures had built up uh, like a big supply of verses that I knew. And... Uh, so that was another way I could walk down the street and I'd be feeling down or upset. <clears throat> and Jesus would um, play a verse in my mind, just quote a verse in my mind, and that would help uh, me in the situation. And uh, so Jesus had two ways at that time of communicating to me. He used to uh, play a scripture in song, song to me. He'd play a scripture verse and um, really uh, developed um, a good relationship with Jesus. So chapter two, uh, we're going to call it the beach. I grew up as a, a surfer uh, in, in a, a, a coastal suburb in, in New South Wales in Australia called Coffs Harbour. And uh, my uh, brother and myself used to surf. I found this beach, which wasn't the most popular beach, and uh, it had smaller waves, but as a surfer, I didn't like to compete uh, on catching waves with other surfers, which surfers is a very, very competitive sort of sport. And so I used to go to this beach where the waves weren't as big, but there was less competition uh, for the waves and uh, even, um, the most popular break, the, the biggest break in the beach, uh, I didn't often surf on that break because there was competition with the surfers. I used to surf on a secondary break that the waves weren't as big, but they, they still were good with less surfers there. And I was at this secondary break and I caught this wave one time and uh, it went into uh, a, another beach that was extended on this beach, but it had some rocks. And I surfed this wave into this other beach and uh, I found that there were nude women and nude men uh, walking on this beach. And I was 14 years of age, uh, which is fairly young for a, a fairly old for a, a young boy these days, but I was 14 years of age and I um, was attracted to these naked females. I'd never seen a naked female before. And um, so I went into this beach and uh, walked up to some females and some males sitting on the beach naked. And uh, I started a conversation with them and uh, they were friendly. And uh, one of the uh, women there said that her niece was coming to the beach the next week and uh, I should come down and uh, her, her niece was 16 and she found out I was 14 and she said that her niece was a nudist too. So uh, if you come to the beach next week, uh, you'll see a 16 year old, you'll see my niece naked. And uh, that was very attractive uh, to a young uh, 14 year old boy. And uh, so I came down to the beach the next week, all excited, but. It was uh, an overcast day where there was uh, clouds in the sky. So uh, that party of people didn't come down that day, but I did sit next to another guy and I was on a nudist beach. So I stripped nude and uh, 
I sat next to this guy and was talking to him. And uh, then he said, do you want to go for a swim? So I said, I went for a swim. It was a, it was a real different experience going for a swim naked. And when I was swimming naked, he uh, reached down and touched me in my private parts. And uh, it uh, initially scared me. And uh, I, um, I ran out of the beach and uh, got my clothes and was riding home. And I was really disappointed with Jesus because I thought I was going to meet like a friend, like a little girlfriend on the beach. And as I was riding home, I said, to Jesus, if, if you don't get me a girlfriend on the way home, if you don't get me a, a girl that can be my friend on the way home, I'm going to go back to the beach and be with that guy. And, um, and Jesus doesn't take threats. Uh, I challenge you, uh, well, I want to warn you not to threaten Jesus. And, uh, I got all the way home and, uh, he hadn't got me a girlfriend. And uh, so I went back to the beach and um, the guy um, was surprised that I come back and uh, uh, he, um, he uh, gave me oral sex. And uh, that was uh, the first time I'd had an erection and uh, the first time I'd ejaculated. And um, seen as I'm talking to guys and uh, uh, a lot of uh, guys are reading this book. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be forthcoming in this book. And please, um, please excuse me if you're, you're a woman and this is um, hard for you. But um, uh, the idea oral sex for a guy is one of the best pleasures, and it's uh, I actually uh, prefer that to actual sex. And uh, and I think it's the case of not doing anything and not expending energy and getting all the same pleasure. So that was, um, even though it was a guy and it was a homosexual act, that was a pleasurable experience for me and something that uh, as I rode home, I wanted to repeat. And um, so he was, uh, that guy on the beach was in his thirties, I'd imagine. And uh, I was 14, so you could uh, call that sexual abuse and you could call him a predator. I wouldn't necessarily call him a pedophile, although a pedophile could be defined as uh, someone having sexual relations with someone under the age of 18. So you could say he's a pedophile, but I think that he was more of a homosexual that just come across a young guy and it was attractive to him. Um, so I, um, I uh, um, started to make a habit of uh, doing that. But um, the next uh, chapter is uh, first porn encounter. So um, I, uh, I went to the beach the next week and, um, and, uh, and uh, I was attracted to naked females and um, I uh, used to see men and we'll talk about that in the next chapter, but um, I uh, knew that there was uh, books on pornography uh, magazines in uh, newspaper shops in, in news agents. And uh, so I bought my first porn magazine and uh, I understood that I could get an erection now and I understood, well, I worked out how to uh, masturbate and uh, the pictures in the magazines did it for me and uh, so I had my first experience as a young basically virgin guy uh, masturbating to pornography and uh, I found that that um, really made me happy and I, I can't explain to you uh, what uh, secret desire what um, need spiritual wound that is fulfilled what what part of a guy is uh, comforted uh, by looking at pornography and masturbating but uh, there's a lot of guys that do it some statistics say over 50 percent of uh, Christians in the church 
uh, view porn and a lot of them are addicted and a high percentage of pastors addicted. Um, so I masturbated to pornography and started buying pornography and uh, that was like a substitute for having a girlfriend. Um, uh, chapter number four, um, uh, the idea that I could just uh, uh, get my surfboard and uh, go down to this beach. I had an excuse for going to this beach because I was going surfing. I used to get surf with my brothers at upper beaches, but I used to go by myself down to that beach. My, my brother never, uh, my older brother, um, who was violent towards me, was a friend too. Uh, he never wanted to go to that beach. He never felt to take his surfboard to that beach because it wasn't the best beach in town. And uh, so I was had an excuse that I was going to that beach and my brother wouldn't want to come. And I'd uh, go down to that beach and um, I'd look at girls and meet girls and talk to women who, who were older on the nudist beach, but also knew a way of approaching uh, the um, homosexuals on the beach and uh, having them perform oral sex on me. And uh, it, uh, it's uh, been with men and, and, and uh, many men would find that repulsive and sick. Uh, but um, if you've had an, an addiction to prostitutes and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, men uh, are listening to this, and a lot of men are reading this book. Um, if you've ever had a prostitute give you oral sex, uh, you understand what that is. And if that's what you were doing with men, uh, men were giving you oral sex, you'd understand, well, at least you know what that is. And uh, I found that pleasurable. I didn't find many other things uh, with homosexuals pleasurable one time. Uh, uh, gay guys wanted to have anal sex with me and I found I felt the very beginning of that uh, and, uh, and and closed it down. I'm very fortunate that the men that I was with at that time didn't force themselves upon me and didn't rape me uh, because that could have happened. Uh, but uh, I've never had oral sex. Uh, I've never had anal sex in my life. And um, I, I was listening to a video about uh, porn stars uh, talking about the industry and uh, she said it took about 20 times for her to have anal sex before it st stopped hurting her and uh, so uh, apparently it can stop hurting and become really pleasurable um, but um, I don't think I'd go through those 20 times because it was starting to really hurt when uh, this guy did it to me so I used to go down and meet men on beaches and perv on women and uh, I never did meet uh, the uh, niece. Uh, she was coming on a holiday and I never did meet her. And uh, what happened um, at church is that I had a relationship with Jesus, but um, I stopped singing. I stopped singing worship. I couldn't uh, worship. Uh, Jesus anymore. I could, couldn't could sing love songs to Jesus anymore. I just couldn't do it. Uh, some people could be in sin and uh, be feeling guilty and condemned and sh shameful and still sing to Jesus and still sing songs. I couldn't do it. Uh, I, I still can't worship unless I'm in the mood uh, to actual worship. Um, I'm very much like that. I, I won't sing a song unless I really like the song. Um, uh, I won't sing to Jesus unless I'm in the mood. And so my whole relationship with Jesus was affected uh, by, by this. And um, there was so much shame and condemnation in what I was doing. It was seriously affecting um, my, my Christian life. Um, so uh, at the age of 14, I got my official calling uh, to be an evangelist uh, in the future and uh, God uh, let me know that um, he uh, he wanted to use me as an evangelist in the future. 
and uh, I'm still waiting. I'm 54, and I'm still waiting uh, to be used as a major evangelist in the world. Um, and yet, uh, at 14, I've got a clear calling uh, to be an evangelist. Uh, chapter number five, the first prostitute. So uh, I was living in a country town um, and uh, I finished my high school certificate at 17 and uh, I was young for my age. So I finished uh, high school uh, when I was 17, but I turned 18 the next year when I moved to the big city uh, called Sydney, Australia. And um, I was with my cousin and uh, he was going to work in the city and I walked to his work from him. But we got off uh, on a station, uh, off the train on a station called King's Cross. And that's like an infamous red light district uh, in Sydney uh, where there's street walking prostitutes. And as I was uh, walking him to his work from that station, that was the closest station to his work. As I was walking to him, there, there was young girls propositioning me saying, are you looking for a girl? And uh, uh, I stopped to listen to one and uh, my cousin said, come on, let's go. And uh, so I left with him uh, and I dropped him off to his work, but I was very eager to come back and see these young girls who are obviously, you'd seen it on TV, obviously prostitutes. And uh, they were uh, asking uh, if I wanted to have a fun time. Um, if I wanted to see a girl. And so I got back and um, there was three on the street and I, um, I uh, picked the prettiest one and uh, I went up to her and she said, do you want to see a girl? And I, I, the obvious answer isn't yes, you want to know how much. So I said, how much? And it was back in uh, 1984. 1985, and uh, she said $20, but $20 Australia is about $12 US. And uh, I said, just $20. She said, you have to pay $10 for the room, but $30. And so we went upstairs and she gave $10 to a guy for the room. And I went inside this small room with her and uh, she asked me if this was my first time. I said, yeah. And uh, she said, I'll just take off your clothes. And here I am, never been with a young girl before. Um, and uh, I knew what it was like to take off my clothes because I've been to the nudist beach. So I took off my clothes and she had sex with me. And um, I thought that was absolutely amazing that I was getting um, $230 a week uh, from my job that I was working in and uh, I could afford $40 a week uh, or $60 for paying for the room. So I worked out that I could afford uh, two girls a week. And um, so I went up there and I found that, um, that, uh, the girls on the street uh, were there in the afternoons, uh, but they weren't there during the day. And I found out uh, some uh, girls uh, worked outside of uh, strip joints, uh, strip joints slash brothels. And I found out that you could go there during the day and they had uh, uh, x-rated movies playing and stuff and sometimes strippers there and then prostitutes used to come out uh, into the audience and ask you if you wanted to go upstairs so i started going there i, I started um quickly working out that there were higher and higher grades of prostitute that um that the street walker was the lowest grade of prostitute um but also Interestingly enough, um, the young girls, uh, like the young girl that I saw, uh, 
a lot of them were like street kids that uh, had left their parents' house from uh, abuse at home and were fresh to the streets. And the girls that hired that room didn't have a pimp and uh, didn't have anyone getting their money and they were like working for themselves. And uh, so I used to like uh, catching those girls. Uh, they were just hard to find. Um, and they're more my age, um, me being 18 and them being 16 or 17 or years of age. Uh, I think uh, most of them were under age or under 18. And um, so um, now for, for you uh, guys who have been addicts, um, I want to say that uh, you understand this for, for uh, women and other people and Christians that are reading this book and um, curious about this book. Uh, this may uh, be really different. Like what's a Christian doing sleeping with these young prostitutes? What, what, what how could you do that? And, uh, all I can say is I've, I've got wounds in myself uh, that um, uh, crying needs that that's like a, if you had a gushing wound on your hand, you could put a, a bandaid strip on your hand and it stopped the blood for a while and then the blood would keep gushing. And uh, so seeing pornography or seeing a prostitute, prostitute is like putting a band-aid on that gushing wound it'll help for a while and then the blood will keep blooding and then you've got to put another <coughs> <coughs> band-aid on it and uh, so this consistent cycle I learned uh, in uh, one of these uh, brothels that there was a thing called an escort and uh, if you got the yellow pages which used to be a book that you looked up with advertisements in it um, i don't know if you have it in america but we used to have this thing called the yellow pages uh, before the internet and you could look under escort agency uh, escorts in in your suburb or the suburb you're close to and uh, you could find escort agencies and Escort agencies is someone, a number that you ring that they'll send out a female. So the next subject is sub, subject six and uh, uh, chapter six. And so um, an escort agency is, is a place where you ring a number and uh, they'll send a girl to your place. You pay an hourly rate for the girl plus uh, uh, a certain amount for the uh, driving to your place and um, so uh, I found this escort agency like back in in the uh, late 80s and um, it was so expensive I could only afford one every two weeks pay I think it was uh, $200 for an hour uh, back then which is a far cry from $20, like $200 was a lot more. And I think it was uh, $20 for the transport. Um, but I found this escort agency that uh, had um, fresh new girls uh, starting every week. And uh, I found that I could ring up on the night that I got the urge and people who are sex addicts understand what an urge is and you get this uh, insatiable uh, desire to sin and uh, nothing can shut it down and it's demonic uh, influence in your life that you can't resist it and uh, you get this insatiable urge so you get on the phone and ring the escort agency and um, she'd tell you what uh, girls are available and describe the girls and then you pick which one you want and she turn up and for for uh, people who are listening to this that aren't a victim aren't aren't uh, an addict 
you may not understand this and I'm just uh, saying this so people can get an understanding. I found uh, the greatest thrill uh, for me uh, as an addict was opening the door to a total stranger and knowing that passing $220 to that stranger would allow her to take her clothes off and have sex with me. And uh, these girls uh, from this escort agency were young, 18, 19, 20, and, uh, and um, a lot of them were uni students, uh, university students, um, putting themselves through college. Uh, very, very, um, I don't know if you have the word in America, girl next door, the very, very stunning girls. And um, this uh, escort agency was a high class agency. It wasn't a lower uh, rate agency. It was very high class and the women were top notch. <coughs> and uh, and uh, so I used to ring up uh, this agency and um, there's, there's, um, there's a verse in Proverbs that says that uh, these women will make you really poor and uh and uh, that's one of the things uh with uh having an addiction to escorts is it'll make you very poor you'll spend a lot of money and there's a breakfast cereal uh in uh australia called whitbix and it's just made out of shredded wheat and you could i could live on whitbix and milk and sugar for five days i could just eat this cereal and that be the only food and uh, today it cost me about um, about thirty dollars for five days, including all the milk. Um, so I could spend all my money and still live for five days with uh, with uh, cheaply. And uh, you shouldn't have to do that. You should be able to eat properly. And uh, one day I was at home with this escort agency. I used to ring up regularly every two weeks. And one day I was home, and this was before um, cell phones. And I got a phone call from this escort agency. And she said to me, Matthew, you must be concerned while I'm ringing you. There's no problem. And I said, yeah. And she said, um, Every time our girls go out, they come back and give us a report of how their date went, how, how their uh, meeting went with the client. And um, you consistently get uh, good reports from the girls. And many of the girls uh, ask, why don't you have them back? And we understand that some clients like yourself like to see a girl, a new girl, uh, each time you ring and we're a large agency and we're always sending you a new girl because we know that uh, you like that. Well, as a large agency, we're constantly hiring new girls and um, it's a hard thing uh, for a girl, uh, as you can understand. It's a hard thing for a new girl to go and see her first client or her first few clients it's a very nerve wracking thing for a girl. And the reason I'm ringing you is because you've got a great reputation with our agency for treating the girls really nicely and, and you're a really nice client. I wanna ask you, could we send our new girls to you once every two weeks uh, when you get paid? Uh, can we uh, tell you uh, the roster of our girls and, uh, and uh, when we have a new girl coming in, can we ring you and tell you um, which girls are starting that week? And can you um, arrange to meet one of the girls each two weeks when you get paid? And I don't know uh, how much you know. Uh, there's two audiences from this, someone who doesn't know anything about prostitutes and escorts and uh, someone who's a Christian who has got no understanding of, of, of the sex industry. Uh, and then there's people who know things. Um, but um, normally you have to be connected. 
uh, to um, get what uh, what the industry calls fresh meat. All right. Normally, uh, when someone's starting in an escort agency, um, the the client, the people who get the girls who have never done it before, um, have got this special authority. Normally, policemen or judges or someone really connected uh, gets these uh, fresh girls. Um, it's not normally um, a client, and so when she offered me this. Well, she'd certainly secured that I was going to spend my money every two weeks. Um, and uh, so I was getting sent uh, girls. She told me, could I just show the girls what they need to do and how to please a client and what I liked and, um, and give them any advice on how to be a good prostitute. And um, so I was getting sent uh, young uni student attractive, stunning girls who'd never slept with a guy before. And I was the guy telling them what to do. And it's a tremendous amount of power. And um, for those who are listening um, and thinking, how could Matthew Robert Payne, we know him, how could he be doing this? Um, once again, I'll, I'll get into uh, the facts that uh, I'm wounded and I've got these things, but you can understand how attractive that would be to um, like a 22 year old getting 18, 19 year old, 20 year old girls who'd never had sex with anyone professionally before. Um, and getting them on their first time. Um, and uh, so uh, she reassured me that I never had to have the girls again, uh, that uh, they'd find someone for her second time. And uh, she uh, guaranteed that they start four girls every two weeks. So I always have a choice of the new girl and uh, I wouldn't have to see her twice. So. Um, so I was voted one of their best clients and for over a year I was uh, seeing girls and introducing them to uh, the prostitution business and um, we believe certain lies. Um, each of us as Christians uh, and non-Christians, we believe certain lies about ourselves like I'm not lovable, I'm not worthy, I'm not a good writer. Uh, we, we believe lies from the enemy and um, this is where a lie got planted in me um, that I was a good client, that I treated girls really well and, uh, and I had a good reputation with this agency. It was true. I was one of their best clients and that's why they rang me up. But it isn't true. I was sexually abusing girls. And um, what I thought was the best opportunity uh, made me one of the most evil people because I was introducing girls through false pretenses uh, of me being a nice client and, and showing them how nice things can be. There'd be some really terrible clients too. And I was introducing her to a life of sex, sex trafficking herself. And um, so um, once I uh, once I got a taste of escorts, it was very hard uh, to go back just to um, prostitutes in the brothel. Uh, a brothel is different uh, to uh, escort agency you can go to a place called a brothel and they may have six girls there and each of the six girls come and stand before you who are available and you pick which one and then you take them upstairs. And there's a certain, um, there's a certain rush in that seeing the six girls and picking the best one that you like out of the six girls. And uh, the six girls have to parade themselves in front of a guy. It's very demeaning. Um, 
and five out of the six don't get picked, but they've got to see all the clients. As every man comes in, they've got to go and put their best foot forward to, to hope that they get chosen. And they don't get paid an hourly rate while they're at the brothel. They only get paid per client and they get 50% per client. So you can see that they really want to impress the guys when they go into the room because they could stay there all night and not get one booking, which means she's got to put eight hours in of a time or 12 hours in and not get any money for it. So she only gets money for her clients. So it's a very victimized business, the sex industry. Okay, so uh, chapter seven, um, my marriage and uh, divorce and rejection. Um, so, at one stage, um, I joined the Amway business, which is a multi-level marketing business, and uh, I was fairly successful in that, but I still had my addiction to prostitutes, so I had no money. Uh, at one stage, I didn't fix my car for six months, I was catching public transport everywhere because I was spending all my money on prostitutes. One day I built this Amway business that had this young girl that was pretty and uh, I introduced myself to her and I was one of the leaders in the business and she was in part of my team and she introduced herself to me and she asked me if I could come and see her personally myself and I said, well, get someone in your team above you to see you. She said, I want to see you. And I thought, that's pretty forceful. And uh, so I went and saw her and showed her the business. And I, I said, um, I'm thinking of leaving the business because um, I think Jesus has told me that I'm not going to become an evangelist through this business. I think he wants to make me into a, an evangelist himself. So. I'm not the best person to be talking to you because I'm thinking of leaving, leaving the business. And uh, I went to another conference that she was at and um, she, she picked me up and wanted to talk to me. And uh, she's really pretty. And uh, she said to me, um, I said to her, I've got to leave now. I've got a date tonight. And, uh, she she said you're going now you're gonna make me jealous and that's really forward behavior uh from a young girl and uh, i thought that was great uh that she said that because i thought i'd follow that up and ask her out on a date and i did i took her out for dinner and we ended up uh, in bed and then i ended up uh, spending so much time at her place that i said that'd be best if I moved in with you. Which is really romantic of me. And she said, I'm not going to live with you unless you agree to marry me. And I said, that's fine. So that was her proposal to me. I said, that's fine. Now, she had a Jezebel spirit and I've uh, struggled with a Jezebel spirit. So I can't just... Um, blame it on her. You can imagine I picked up a lot of demons sleeping with prostitutes. So I got married to her and uh, the marriage lasted 18 months and uh, I, I, we, we got married because she felt pregnant and I don't know how she felt pregnant because I was, she said she was on the pill and um, so I don't know how she got pregnant. She got pregnant and uh, uh, I wasn't going to marry her. My parents said uh, just because she's pregnant is not a good reason to get married. And uh, they were worried for me. And uh, she'd broken up with me. And then she rang me that uh, she was pregnant and we we're going to get married. And my parents said it's not a really good reason to get married. I'll just let her have the child and start a relationship. And if your relationship is going fine, we'll get married for sure. But and um, I told her what my parents said. And she said, if you don't marry me, you'll never see me or the child again. And so I said, do you love me? And she said, of course, I love you. And 
So we got married and 18 months later, you can imagine we separated and we got a divorce. Um, the Lord has spoken to me about this marriage that I've still got forgiveness that I've got to forgive her. Um, and, uh, and there's a, a big uh, part of me of rejection, uh, like a wound of rejection and, and, marrying this pretty wife and the mother of my son um, and uh, losing her. And uh, there's still got to be work done in counselling, uh, losing her. Um, and her name was Sharon. And uh, uh, in the book, uh, the, the uh, way she spells Sharon is S-H-A-R-R-Y-N. And uh, it's a really uh, nice spelling of Sharon. And I still love Sharon today, even though she caused me a lot of problems. Uh, chapter eight is losing son. Uh, so it came a stage uh, in Sharon's life where she started uh, living with a guy and, uh, and got engaged to a guy and decided uh, she was gonna marry this guy who was the preacher's son and uh, when she was engaged to um, this guy, she said to me that I can't see my son anymore. And uh, I said that I'll fight her in a custody fight uh, to have access to my son, to have legal access. And the last time I'd done that, um, I was put in a psych ward. She did witchcraft on me and I ended up um, having a nervous breakdown and getting a mental illness. Um, and so I'd had this breakdown uh, in the midst of this custody fight last time. And when she said, I can't see my son anymore, I said, I'll take you to court. And she said, bring it on. We all know what happened last time. And uh, I took it to Jesus and Jesus said, don't fight over your son. I want you to move from Brisbane, which is a Northern city in Australia. I want you to move to Sydney and I want you to let her new husband bring up your son. And uh, that's, um, that's a major grief in a father's life. Um, my son's now 27. Um, it's been 19 years and I've only seen my son once uh, when he was 22. Um, so I've only seen my son once in 19 years. So um, he even uh, doesn't reach out to me, doesn't really respond to my emails. So there's a, quite a bit of rejection there too. Uh, uh, my son rejecting me, my wife rejecting me, and it's just broken my heart. Some people um, in the past have known me for years and not even known that I had a son because it's a very uh, hurtful subject uh, to talk about. When I lost my wife and, uh, and uh, when I broke up with my wife, I uh, caught a train uh, from Brisbane, the Northern city to Coffs Harbour where my parents lived and uh, I'd lost my wife and I was going to lose access to my child. I was only going to be able to see my son two days every two weeks. And I was really broken. And uh, uh, I, um, my sister uh, sat me down and um, she, I told uh, my sister that um, Sharon, my wife, had been sexually abused by her stepfather. And my sister said she had a list of 25 personality characteristics of someone who's been sexually abused. And she said, I can see nine of these in Sharon. Sit down with the list and tell me how many uh, you can see in Sharon. And I sat down. And I could see 12, but as I went through the list, there was a lot of mine on the list. And um, Carmen, my sister said, that's really interesting. She's got 12. She said, this list has got 25, Matthew. And 
I've seen nine in Sharon, but I've seen 15 in you. Who abused you? And this list was like a comprehensive list of personality characteristics that if someone has more than six of them, there's a good chance they were sexually abused. But if they had 15, they've definitely been sexually abused. And I'd lost my wife, I'd lost my job, I'd lost my child. My wife was my reason for living. My son gave me a lot of joy. I'd lost everything. And when my sister said, who abused you? I told her about the beach and what happened at the beach. And um, what I found out was I'd been sexually abused and that's sexual abuse. And uh, I was a sexual abuse victim. But my sister never gave me a book on healing yourself from sexual abuse or how to cope with sexual abuse. She just opened this wound and said, this is what's happened to you, but she didn't help me. And uh, it all came out that I'd lived this gay lifestyle and was addicted to prostitutes and stuff before I met my wife. And uh, here I was, this broken individual. I was in the shower at my parents' place and uh, I was, uh, I was thinking about my hard life and how I didn't want to live. And then I finally decided in the shower that I may as well just end it. I may as well just kill myself. And some people would say that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Well, I got a tremendous sense of relief when I decided to kill myself. And it was like Satan has peace because it was such a relief, it was peaceful. And uh, so I didn't stress about how I was going to do it because I hadn't worked out how I was going to do it. I just decided that I was going to do it. And uh, my mother, as far as I know, had only heard from Jesus three times in her life. And she was outside and she got told by the Holy Spirit, get Matthew's in danger. Um, and uh, she sent my younger brother, who was a counsellor, into, um, into the shower. She said, get into the shower, Matthew's in trouble. And my brother came into the shower. I was getting out of the shower. I was embarrassed that I was naked and put a towel around myself. I got angry at him. He said, what's going on? And I said, I've had enough. And uh, he said to me, I can understand you want to kill yourself. Well, that's the Holy Spirit telling him that. Like, mum had said I'm in trouble, but my mum hadn't said that I was suicidal. My brother said straight away, I can understand you want to kill yourself. And he said, um, you've lost your wife, your child. Uh, we haven't been really friendly to you, haven't been a good family. And... Um, he says, I, I counsel drug re, at a drug rehabilitation farm and like a rehab. And um, I've counseled guys and they've been with me for a year. Then I've left the rehab and I've overdosed within a week of leaving the rehab. And I know that they didn't make a mistake with the heroin. I know that they gave themselves an overdose to kill themselves. And here I have a person in front of me that if I don't give you a reason to live, I know that you're going to kill yourself. And you don't have to worry about mum and dad and your sisters and brothers and your friends. You don't have to worry. I'll explain it to them, how you're feeling and how uh, you, um, how you're feeling depressed. And I'll explain suicide to them and how dangerous it is. And so you don't have to worry about killing yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll tie things over. They won't call you weak or, or, or a coward. 
Um, I'll make sure everything's right. If you decide to kill yourself, um, I'll make sure everything's right with them. And then he started crying. He said, but I don't want to lose you. So I've got to give you a reason to live. And he said, you grew up with a violent father, with a violent brother, with no real friends. You got married and your wife left you. You've lost your son. You've been sexually abused. You've slept with men. You've slept with prostitutes. You've had addictions. He said, Matthew, do you know all you need to do is get up and share your story? You don't even have to have answers for people. Do you know how many thousands of people would be in a better state if they heard your story. All you need to do is get up. All you need to do is get up. I can see you in front of thousands of people one day just sharing your story. And in that day, you don't even have to have the answer. Just knowing what you've been through will be enough. He said, if you can't get up for mum and dad and your sisters and brothers, if you can't get up for your wife and your child or any of your friends, get up for those people. And uh, I, I heard, uh, and that's the reason for this book, um, I heard um, someone teach on suicide one time and they said it's important to give people permission to kill themselves. It's important to accept that they want to suicide and give them permission uh, to say that um, it's okay if you want to suicide. Uh, can you do me a favor? When you decide to do it, can you come and see me one more time and I want to take you out for coffee to say goodbye? And if you accept that they're going to do it and then offer them one more encounter with yourself uh, before they do it, um, you can save their life because it's not so much being scared of them doing it. It's the suicidal person needs people to accept that they've got enough pain that they want to leave. And if you can say that you accept that, it takes away their need to kill themselves. So. That's suicide thoughts. So chapter 10, seeking counseling, uh, finding issues. So um, for years and years and years, I struggled with this addiction to prostitutes and pornography. It really wore down on me. And um, I went to this a counseling one time called Elijah House Ministries. And they taught on repentance. And they said that King Saul got confronted with his sin and he made excuses to say the people wanted to sacrifice. And so I arranged it and you weren't here. So uh, we, we did the sacrifice. And Samuel had said to him, don't, uh, do the sacrifice until I'm there, but he bowed to people's pressure and did the sacrifice. And but he wasn't repentant; he was making excuses. But King David, when he was confronted by Nathan the prophet, he repented for his sin for sleeping with Bathsheba. And it was a one-hour teaching on what true repentance is. And um, we went downstairs to discuss the video and I shared my addiction to prostitutes and um, the counsellor says, all I hear from you is boasting, Matthew. You're not truly sorry. You actually think you're a good client. You actually think you treat the girls. He said, until you can understand that you're abusing yourself, 
you're raping these girls and you're abusing God until um, until you can accept that and truly repent. You're never going to be free of this. And uh, I went to my church the next week and I said, um, the Holy Spirit told me to say out loud to the church that, my righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. And I said that to the church and I, I got free of my uh, sex addictions for six months. And um, I went on a, a, a ministry trip and a woman read a letter from a pedophile that he'd written to her and um, uh, my addiction came back uh, because there was a spiritual force on the letter. Um, so I got free, but when I got free of the sex addiction after I repented, um, and that worked for some reason, I've tried to do it again and it hasn't worked. Um, but when I got free, I got this sleep sickness, which I used to... Um, I used to go to bed at 11 o'clock, but um, I'd wake up at eight o'clock and I'd be too tired. I'd wake up at 11, I'd be too tired. I'd wake up at two, I'd go back to sleep. I was too tired, I'd wake up at six. And then I'd be up for a couple of hours and I was too tired. And I'd end up taking sleeping pills to get to sleep again. And I was sleeping 21 hours a day and uh, that went on for four years and uh, I got that uh, malady, like I had that illness uh, for four years uh, because I gave up my addiction to prostitutes. I got it initially uh, a week after I gave up my addiction to prostitutes. So I fell back into my addiction with prostitutes, uh, but that malady stayed. Um, so, um, so, I tried counselling um, and some issues have come up um, in that Elijah House Ministries. Um, uh, they, they talked about um, how there can be a mother who uh, is uh, mistreated by her, her husband. And she can take a young son aside and ask the son to be like a spiritual husband for her. She can befriend the son and tell the son all her woes and all her troubles and emotionally lean on the young son to be a friend. And it was in a whole hour video about this case, how it's very destructive and really injures the child. And then at the end of it, I say, if you think you've got someone that you're counseling, that this has happened to, this will manifest itself in two ways that the son will have a mental illness, a major mental illness, schizophrenia or bipolar, and the son will have a major sex addiction that can't be broken. And uh, I cried when, when I heard that because uh, that's what my mother had done to me. So um, another thing that's come out in counseling that I saw a vision of my mother um, coming home with the news that she was pregnant and my dad chucked a fit and was so angry because he'd only planned on having two children. I was the third child. And uh, so they talked in Elijah House Ministries of how a baby can be rejected in the womb and a baby can hear rejection. Uh, if a father or a mother doesn't want the child, the, the, the baby can hear it. So I've had rejection from my father and I've had uh, this case with my mother i've had rejection from my wife and also when i was a young child uh, my father used to work a lot of overtime and uh, he used to work extra hours at work and um, he was always away he was away 
uh, before I woke up in the morning and he was coming home after I'd gone to sleep as a child. And uh, so I only used to see him as one day a week. And as a little child, I perceived that as my dad didn't love me. He was rejecting me. And so I've got all these core issues that have to be fixed. And I've tried and I've tried um, counselling. And uh, there's some of my core issues. So point number 11 is try everything, no success. So I've gone to therapist after therapist after therapist. Uh, trying to get free of, of this addiction, trying to get free of these two addictions. And um, what I hear, and I'm going to bring up this uh, later, but what I hear uh, through the course of life in churches, that sexual sin is such a bad thing. And I can, I can tell you personally that you really have to do a number on yourself to get your spirit free once you've uh, committed uh, pornography or you've slept with a prostitute. You're so bound up with guilt and shame and, and condemnation that you have to come before the Lord and set yourself free of that or you just can't get anything done. You can't experience worship. You can't get close to God. It really affects your intimacy with Jesus. And um, uh, so um, not only does it affect your walk with God uh, and the shame and the guilt and the condemnation weigh you down, but you're constantly hearing about people who've fallen, of being feeling, uh, fallen guilty of seeing prostitutes or falling in adultery or uh, how bad sexual sin is. And that's all you ever hear of how bad it is. And uh, when, when you're like me, when you've tried and tried and tried, and it's amazing, uh, churches used to have counseling that was free. The Elijah House Ministries training, uh, you know, I tried to pay them and they did it free, but most counselling today you have to pay for. Uh, I'd gladly pay $5,000, $10,000 to find a therapist that could actually set me free. And I've only recently, in the last couple of days, been watching videos of what I have to, what I may have to do uh, to get free and uh, but I've lived 53 years with 30 years in this addiction and I've never heard what I've just heard in the last couple of days so I tried everything I had no success and still here at 53 turning 54 in three days time I, I still haven't had success so I want to say to you uh, guys and, and girls out there who, who've got sex addictions, it's very hard to get free. It's very hard to break these addictions. And uh, I understand. I understand. And here I am, a guy who's written over 60 books and 800 uh, Christian articles and, and, uh, and done 3,000 Christian videos and operate in a prophetic anointing and do prophecies for people. Here I am in Christian ministry and I'm addicted and, uh, and I'm guilty. And uh, I've got victims. There's girls that I've seen as prostitutes that uh, are victims. Uh, chapter 12, full-blown escort addiction. So um, for years, I've seen prostitutes. And when I used to ring up these escorts, uh, some of the best girls not only work in uh, escort agencies, but uh, a lot of girls freelance. And they advertise for themselves and they run their own business. And when I used to ring them up, 
I used to ask them, do you kiss? And um, rarely, rarely, really, really, rarely will a prostitute kiss. But I found this prostitute once uh, in Brisbane years ago who kissed. And I never used to see a prostitute twice, but this prostitute used to give you a massage and she used to passionately kiss. And so I kept on going to her. And one time it was the weekend and she wasn't working. And I rang another prostitute and I asked her if she kissed and she said she did. And when I went there, she passionately kissed and I ended up uh, getting engaged to that girl. And it was a bit of a love story. And uh, you can read about that girl in uh, my autobiography called He's Redeeming Love. So I won't go into that, but it's a really uh, rare thing uh, for a prostitute to kiss, but there's an escort agency in Sydney. There's an escort website in Sydney where girls freelance for themselves and run their own business. And there's a thing called uh, uh, Deep French Kissing, it's called. And um, you can look up, search that uh, search criteria with a girl, and all the girls that say Deep French Kissing, they passionately kiss. And I really like that. But one of those escorts uh, is $650 uh, Australian uh, for an hour. And so you really have to pay a lot of money. It's very expensive. And um, so um, so I had a full blown uh, uh, escort addiction uh, for years. And uh, I had, um, I had uh, one girl I mentioned uh, that I saw and uh, we talked and we kissed and um, we had uh, we had sex and uh, I'll tell you another thing uh, about escorts and people addicted to uh, prostitutes would would understand this that uh, rarely do they kiss and also uh, rarely will a prostitute ever uh, have a sexual climax. Uh, rarely will a prostitute ever orgasm. Um, most prostitutes will make noises as so though they are, but they're faking it. And uh, uh, I don't, I'm not sure, I can't speak for every guy because I'm not every guy, but I can tell when a, a girl is having a real orgasm or not. And I had this girl that I've seen as an escort and uh, she, um, she had uh, three orgasms when I was with her and she was passionately kissing. And I've had a few girlfriends in my time and I've become uh, an experienced lover. And um, she had three orgasms. And uh, uh, I, so I booked her again. And the next time I was with her, uh, she knew I was a Christian. The next time I was with her, she said, do you like, like this uh, girl? And um, it was Kim Walker Smith from Jesus Culture. And I said, yeah, she said, I've got some songs on, on an album that she produced. Can I sing them to you? And here I was lying naked in the bed. We just had sex. And um, normally I'd have sex more than once. And she put uh, these songs playing on her iPhone the music played out loud and she sang three of these songs of this girl and she was worshiping. She was, she's a 23 year old stunning blonde and she's singing her heart out worshiping in bed naked with me. And uh, I just couldn't sleep with her after that. I was like, uh, you know, if you heard the songs, if, if you actually heard, I could, uh, I put in the book the actual names of the songs and you can go and listen to the songs. And one of the songs says, um, you define me. I, I know who I am and you, it's only your words that count. It's only the words that you speak over me that count. You define me. And um, it was an amazing song. And um, so I decided I can't see it for sex anymore. So... I did something I've never done before. I I texted her the next time. I said, 
do you ever make for coffee just for coffee and uh, she said yeah and i said how much is that and she said 250 dollars for an hour and i said oh that's a third of the price that's a good deal and i raised a meter for coffee and i talked to her for an hour and i found that i didn't need to have sex and i thought well this will be the answer i'll just pay for that and i'll see her every two weeks and uh I've got spare money in my pension, so I wasn't using my ministry money for these girls. And I've got spare money in my pension. I can afford to see it every two weeks. And um, uh, But she'd never commit to uh, seeing me for coffee again. She couldn't understand why I'd seen her for sex three times or twice. I'd seen her for sex twice and why I've seen her for coffee once, that's okay for once, but why can't you go back to 650? And I finally wrote to her and said, I'll pay you 650 to see you for coffee. And she wouldn't accept it. And uh, we exchanged a few emails uh, since then. I fell in love with her and uh, I've since taken a few escorts out uh, for coffee rather than have sex for it's expensive to take a girl out for coffee for 250 dollars for an hour but better than 650. Um, and now um, the government has given me government workers who uh, will go out with me for an hour and i don't have to pay them uh, which is uh, really good so i had a full-blown escort addiction but um uh her name was Haley, and uh, there's been are three escorts that I've fallen in love with, and uh, her name was Haley. Um, the one uh, I saw uh, in Brisbane, uh, Chloe, who I got engaged to, uh, she she's mentioned in my book, He's Redeeming Love, and you can read about her in that book if you like. Um, chapter 13 uh, had a full blown porn addiction, and uh, when you've got the money when you've got the finances to see a prostitute um i explain it to you that it's why there's a demonic influence uh, in your life because when you've got the money to see a prostitute when that urge comes on it's like 10 out of 10 sort of temptation and when you've got a demon it's like a 10 out of 10 when you've broken the addiction like i've broken it for six months twice before when the temptation comes on the strength of the temptation is only one out of ten so you can easily say no i'm not going to do it but uh, when you've got the full-blown addiction when the temptation comes it comes fully on and i found one way that I could save money from seeing prostitutes and not spending my money was when the urge came on just to look up pornography and, and uh, masturbate to pornography. And that way, when I run myself out of sperm, then I'd be wasting my money to see a prostitute. So I used to say the only way that I saved money on prostitutes was to masturbate to porn. and. Uh, I've said that to guys in bars. I've said that to other guys when I've been frank uh, talking to guys and they've laughed their heads off thinking that was so funny. Uh, that the only way, I used to say the only way I saved money was uh, masturbating to porn. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so um, if you've got an addiction to pornography, um, this guy was teaching that I listened to in the last couple of days. Um, and uh, he was uh, sharing that uh, when we've done habitual things, we've got neuro, neural pathways in our mind and our mind has been uh, programmed uh, for the addiction. And uh, for us to break the addiction, we've got to rewrite the pathways in our mind. And uh, so it's not an easy fix. It's not as easy as just saying a prayer and repenting sometimes. And uh, 
So uh, I've had a full-blown addiction to escorts and prostitutes and um, um, number 14 uh, uh, is called Confessing Sin in Books. So uh, if uh, you've ever followed my books, uh, if you're one of the people who has read 50 of my books or 30 of my books, um, you'll notice that um, I'm very open and transparent about my sin in my books and I often mention my addiction to pornography and prostitute. That was one of the ways I tried to get free. That um, it says to um, confess your sins one to another in James. And uh, I thought, um, while ever I was addicted, I'm going to keep the sin out in the open. I'm not going to be hidden. When, when you've got a hidden sin, then it has power over you. Um, I know that um, producing this video, I know that producing this book takes power off the enemy. Uh, that I know that he's not happy about this video. He's not ha happy that this book is going to produce. And it's just been quite a bit of warfare around getting ready uh, to do this video. Uh, so I, I constantly confessed my sin in my books saying I'm struggling with this. Um, and uh, I want you to know that uh, it'll do you good if you're listening to this video or you're reading this book to confess your sin to someone. Um, if you're watching this video and you've got a membership on YouTube, it'll do you good just to write a comment under this video. I struggle with these sins too. And if you name them, it'll even do you better. I struggle with prostitutes, I struggle with pornography, I struggle with both of those sins. It'll do you good just to write a comment under this video. I, I'm here saying to you that I haven't got the answer. I'm thinking my answer is uh, to go back and get a bit of counselling, but um, this guy who shared this video uh, that I watched uh, was saying that he, he, he needed community and he needed an, a, a, a sex addict anonymous uh, he needed that community and he needed a sponsor to get free to rewrite his pathways in his mind. So my next step is to uh, to uh, join an AA group for sex addicts. And uh, you, you think that you can just solve it yourself. Um, and he talked about that in his interview. I'll see if I can put his interview uh, in uh, the description tag that you can listen to this guy who's a pastor who was addicted to porn and prostitutes, even though he was married. Um, you, you can hear him and listen to him. He does a lot better job than me. And uh, he was saying that one of the most common misconceptions is that you'll just be able to solve it yourself. And one day God will just take it away and he said that he'd had um, uh, times of sobriety, uh, but whenever pressure come into his life, he'd go back to his addiction. So uh, we want to make a break that's a break forever. We don't want to make a break for three months and fall back into it. Although that's good for your Christian life and uh, for your peace of mind to be free of it for three months. You certainly get some freedom. It certainly brings a lot of joy. When I went for six months uh, recently uh, in the last year, I thought I was finally free. I did a video, a 17 minute video about this. I was so happy. Uh, 4,000 people have watched that video. So many people have commented on it. It's been so popular. And, uh, and, uh, helped a lot of people that video, but, 
I, then I fell back into it and I felt so ashamed. And I want, I want to tell you guys while I, I'm talking uh, here that it's such a lonely, sad state to be in. And uh, if you can find people, if you can go uh, to Sex Addicts Anonymous, if you can find people to relate to, uh, to talk honestly with no holds barred, talk about your, your sin, talk about your problem, uh, you're going to find relief and camaraderie in other men and other addicts. Um, I never wanted to be part of... It was pride in me. I never wanted to be part of an Alcoholics Anonymous thinking I've got a disease, that I'm a victim, that um, I'm hopeless. I, I wanted just to fix it. And uh, Jesus has brought me full circle and he's humbled me. Uh, like my sin has humbled me that um, I've had enough, guys. You know, if, if I could shoot myself... Um, I'd shoot myself, but it's painful. And, um, yeah, so, um, so chapter uh, 15 is uh, I had a six-month relief of my sin. Uh, initially, years ago, when I said uh, my, my righteousness is filthy rags, I got free for six months, and then that pedophile, uh, heard that pedophile's letter and that sent me back into it. Um, and then the temptations for that six months were one out of ten. But after that pedophile's letter, the next temptation came. It's like something grabs hold of you and pulls you down. It's like you can't resist it. And uh, then my recent six-month relief uh, was very beneficial and I thought I was finally free. And um, it's hard not to get prideful when you get free. You start boasting and you start uh, being really happy. And uh, if you're listening to this and you're not a sex addict and you're just listening or reading this book because you want to find out information, can you imagine living your Christian life where you're always sinning, where you're always being condemned with guilt and shame? Uh, where you constantly have to uh, get your leg up and uh, and uh, get your peace back with God. Um, number 16, falling back into sin. Uh, so when I was free for six months, uh, it was uh, tremendous relief. It was amazing. Um, my brother actually came to stay at my house and he had an addiction to pornography and prostitutes. And when he stayed at my house, he got free of the sin. And it was like there was a presence in my house that got him free too. And I was really happy uh, for that six months. And it was really happy times in, in my Christian life. Falling back into sin was so depressing, um, so sad for me. And... Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how you feel. I, I don't know how many pastors or people in ministry are watching this or reading this book. But when you've got these sins in your life and you can't conquer it, I think part of the strength is uh, knowing that you can't conquer it. When you finally admit you can't conquer it and you need help, I think you're on your way. But when you've got these sins in your life and you can't conquer it, it just breaks your heart. It just makes you feel worthless, it makes you feel hopeless. And uh, I, uh, my, chapter 18, three stages of life, mother. So my mother died um, in August uh, 2019. And uh, so it's 18 months ago. 
and I speak to my mother from heaven. I can speak to her any time I choose. And uh, my mother had this long conversation with me once and said that I've got three stages. The first stage of my life was my first 55 books. And uh, that was my first stage. Now I'm entering into the second stage, which is a stage of healing and, and a stage of rest. Um, I used to strive a lot and always be doing things to impress God and doing things to make myself feel good. And that's striving. And she said that um, when I stop writing books and I have a time of healing and a rest, uh, Jesus is going to teach me how to move out of rest and live in rest. Interestingly enough, she said the second stage was a stage of healing. And she said the third stage in my life is when I'm going to be discovered and uh, I'm going to be popular in the world. And uh, at that stage, I'll have all these books and, uh, and uh, I'll go really well. And uh, so she told me really clearly that I had three stages and I'm in this middle stage of rest and healing. And I realized uh, no one wants to get healed more than me, but uh, I've only recently realized uh, when I've watched this video that I'll post down below that uh, I've had pride uh, not wanting to go to an AA group, but um, I know at an AA group, I'll be able to find a therapist. Someone will know a good Christian therapist and um, uh, I may be able to see so someone else's therapist. Um, but uh, so perhaps I needed to struggle this long before I got desperate enough to take my pride away and go and be with a group of men and women, maybe women uh, who've got sex addictions. I always thought that uh, people at sex addiction classes uh, that have sex with each other because you know, you're all sex addicts, so you might as well have a bit of sex. But um, I'll go there and be a hundred men and there won't be a woman. That'll be my chance. And I haven't uh, slept with a man since I was 22. Uh, so I'm not into men anymore. And, um, but I'm in this second stage of life. So um, I, I realized that when my mother said the three stages, uh, the third stage isn't going to start until the second stage is finished. And, uh, and if the title of the second stage is rest and healing, well, the healing's got to finish before stage three starts. So it's very insightful from my mother. It really brought me a lot of peace. I remember when my wife first left me, I, I uh, went to this Pentecostal church and the first time I've been to a Pentecostal church when we went to a uh, men's uh, camp, like a men's fellowship camp and it had this Pentecostal minister and he said he was going to prophesy, uh, do prophecies for each of us. And I didn't know what prophecy was because I was a Baptist. And he said, I'm going to pray for you. And at a certain time, in the prayer, Jesus is going to speak to you through me. And when he's going to speak, I'll say, thus saith the Lord, and then Jesus will speak. And I've been speaking to Jesus all my life. I learned at about 26 to hear from Jesus. And uh, so I was pretty amazed. And as I said, Jesus had spoke to me in verses and songs before. And uh, I had a good relationship with Jesus. So it was really impressive. This was about 26. And this guy came to me and said, Thus saith the Lord, you're really in a dark and uh, a really dark tunnel at the moment. And you can't see that there's going to be any light at the end of the tunnel. And my wife had just left me and she had an affair with another guy, had another boyfriend. And I was wanting her to break up with her boyfriend and come back to me. And I lost custody of my son and I was only seeing my son every two weeks it was very dark I really loved my wife and uh, I was pining for her I wanted her back and I was really depressed it was a very dark tunnel 
and uh, he said, you, you don't even know if there's even going to be light at the end of the tunnel. And he said, uh, there's going to be light and one day you're going to come out of the tunnel and uh, God is going to heal you. And then, um, then he's going to raise you up into ministry. And just as Billy Graham was known throughout the world, so shall your name be. And um, so about a year ago, I had a prophecy and someone said, uh, Jesus said, you've just come out of the tunnel. And, um, and it didn't mean anything to the person, but it meant a lot to me that uh, I was entering into this stage. And at the last stage of that prophecy, he said, you're going to be healed and then God's going to raise you up in the ministry. Well, I've been trying to raise myself up in the ministry, writing these books and doing videos, writing articles. But I've always known that I've got to be healed. And, uh, and I've tried and I've tried. No one's really tried like me. I've gone from uh, counsellor to counsellor, really trying to get healed. And uh, we realised so far that I had to be humble. I had to reach a stage where I'll actually go to sex addicts and maybe you've got to wait a year or two or five years. You know, I'm never going to get to stage three until I get the healing done. And part of my healing journey is to make this video and, and to produce this book. Part of my healing was to obey the Holy Spirit and confess all this and say, hey, uh, this guy that's written these 60 books, he's just a broken individual. And um, everything I say in the books is, is, is true and right and you should obey Jesus and you should follow Jesus. And I do. And besides my sexual sin, I've, I've got this tremendous intimate relationship with Jesus. Uh, but um, I've got to reach this third stage. Or I've got to finish my healing, I've got to get healed, and then God's going to raise me up in the ministry. So chapter 19, um, uh, problems with hidden sin in the church. I'm going to start that, um, but right at the moment, I've been drinking Coca-Cola, and I've got to go to the toilet. So I'll come back and uh, we'll start uh, chapter 19. So chapter 19, uh, problems with hidden sin in the church. We shared so far that according to the statistics that you look up, over 50% of Christian males uh, view pornography and have an addiction to porn. I heard one statistic that they had a pastor's conference and they did a survey in the conference of how many pastors view porn. And 30% uh, of the pastors at the pastor's conference admitted to viewing porn more than twice a month, 30%. And, and this is one of, I, I've built all this uh, book and I've been so frank with my sin to, uh, Talk about this. If 50% of the males in the church have got a problem with pornography, um, I heard a statistic that one in six men 
have slept with a prostitute. So I'm not saying that one in six men are addicted to prostitutes, but one in six men have slept with a prostitute. But if 50% of the men in a church have slept uh, 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 addicted to porn, that means when you're in church worshipping, putting your hands up in the air and worshipping, Either the guy on your right or the guy on your left is addicted to porn. So if it's a church of 300 people in the building, you know, 150 women, 150 men, 70 men in that church are addicted to porn. There's a good chance that two of the men on the stage are addicted to porn. There's a 50%, a 30%, a 30 to 50% chance that the pastor of your church is addicted to porn. And this is the point I want to get to. It says that in James that we should confess our sins one to another. And the sad fact of the matter is that no one in ministry comes forth and makes videos like this. I was really blessed by seeing this pastor uh, make this video and I'll put it in the description tag down below. Watching his video saying he was addicted to prostitutes and porn but we've had that uh, Ravi Zacharias uh, exposed for seeing all these uh, massage therapists and having this massive sex addiction. The whole world's gone crazy over it. But my question is, the whole Christian church is throwing stones at him. But my question is, why, why does such a powerful man of God get trapped in a sin like that? And why isn't there people that he can talk to and get free of it? See, here's the problem, guys and girls. You can't confess your sin in the church. And that shouldn't be. You should be able to confess your sins and get free of them. You should be able to have people that can walk with you and support you and understand you. I was sharing this with a former pastor of mine last night that I was going to do this video and produce this book called Stop Throwing Stones. And he was talking about Ravi and saying it's such a shame that he had no one to confide in. He couldn't get free that he was stuck in this sin. And we're talking about people saying that he's in hell and I said he's in heaven, I've already spoken to him. Um, there's, uh, there's major, there's a prophet that I follow that I really admire that says that he was a false prophet and a false teacher and a wolf. And um, that's the case that you could identify him as a wolf, but he's still a Christian and he's still a broken man. What happens to all the broken men and the broken women that are in churches? And the problem is, there's a problem with hidden sin in the church. People come to church and you ask them how they are. Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. But the night before he was masturbating the porn. I mean, if people didn't wash their hands, you'd be shaking hands with someone who's just masturbated. I mean, there's so many problems. Uh, there, there's so many problems with an addiction to porn. Um, it makes you look at women, objectify women. It, it, it changes your view of women. You, 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 your eyes undress women. You, you think women are, are, are meat. You, you think women can be used. You, you have a low opinion of women. Um, there's so many things wrong with pornography. Uh, bad behavior, bad thoughts, bad 
mind concepts that you have. And uh, if 50% of the men in church are addicted to porn or viewing porn, we've got a big problem. And it's not just single men. It's a lot of married men. And you may be thinking as a woman or as a wife, is your man addicted to porn? Or if you know he is addicted to porn, how's he going to get free? And uh, this uh, video that I'll quote down below in the, uh, in the description tag and in the actual book, when it's produced, it'll have the name of the video. So you can uh, look it up on YouTube. But um, your man needs to work on himself. If you've got a man who's addicted to porn, he's got to work on himself. And if he's addicted to prostitutes, he's got to do the same sort of work on himself. Because you've got to fix that problem. It just can't. I've discovered and you've, you've found uh, through this video as I've done it, I've discovered it's been a hard discovery, but I've discovered it's not going to go. I thought it was going to go like, when it went for six months, it just happened. So what happened to my neural pathways for that six months? Had they been reprogrammed for six months and then it switched back to the old way? I don't know what happened. I was supernaturally um, delivered by the grace of God. And here's something I want to share with you. If nothing you've ever tried has worked and you can't do it in your own power, You need the grace of God to set you free. And if the grace of God isn't being given to you, if God isn't giving him you the power to overcome, who's responsible? If you need a sovereign act of grace to stop, are you really responsible if you can't? And this is what I find with the Christian church is they throw stones. Remember the woman caught in adultery? Um, they all surrounded and they all had stones in it. And I heard someone describe what being stoned was. It's like breaks your body in all sorts of pieces and your, 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 Parts of your body, your, your internal organs start to break down. And you start to drown in your own blood. It's just horrific death. Someone described it once and it was horrific. Well, that's what they were going to do to this woman. They all had the big stones in their hands that they were going to throw at her. And Jesus let down and started writing in the sand. I believe personally he was writing names of sin in the ground different sins or individual sins of the actual guys. And when they read that, they walked away. And Jesus said, neither do I accuse you, go and sin no more. And people, people read that last part, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. But the first part of it was healing to a heart, neither do I condemn you. Is the most righteous man in Israel, a rabbi, saying to her she wasn't condemned. Well, when you're stuck in sin, which she was caught in adultery, you think you're worthless. You think this is all you can deserve is sleeping with another married man. Her, his, his words, neither do I condemn you, healed her. But Christians... They, they jump on the second part, go and sin no more. And they say you can be forgiven, but you've got to stop sinning. She, she, he said, go and sin no more. But do you, do you realise what you're saying when you say that to a person? When you preach that, when you share that with someone else, Jesus said, yeah, she was forgiven, but he said, go and sin no more. Do you realise that you're throwing stones? Do you realise even saying that statement, you're throwing stones at a person who continues to sin? Do you realise that you're throwing stones with that statement? 
You remember Jesus uh, healed that person uh, at Bethsaida where, where he's lying by the pool where the angel used to stir the pool. When he healed that person and the Pharisees found out and he pointed out Jesus and he said, he healed me. Jesus said to him, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. He said to that guy too, go and sin no more. Well, what had he done? Jesus had said that this is, it was no one's fault. It wasn't his fault or his parents' fault, but this was here to reveal the glory of God. Then the people of those days believed that you got sin and disease because you sinned. So when Jesus said, go and sin no more to him, Jesus was saying, don't do anything that may bring this sickness back to you. Because that was their concept. When the guy was brought in and they opened up the roof and lowered that paralytic in to Jesus, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Why did Jesus say that and not say, get up, you're healed? Because that guy had such a stronghold that his sins had made him a paralytic. So when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, that took that bondage away from the guy's mind, saying, well, if his sins are forgiven, he doesn't deserve to be sick. And then Jesus said, pick up your mat, mat and he was healed. When Jesus said to the woman in adultery, neither do I condemn you, she received forgiveness of Jesus, but she was also given permission not to condemn herself. And one of the things that keeps you in uh, the bondage to sin and the cyclical uh, uh, bondages, one of the things that makes these neuro pathways is that you believe that you're full of shame and guilt and condemning. You believe you're such a bad sinner that because you live in this state of condemnation, it continues in this cycle. So we all need a Jesus to say you're forgiven. And honestly, I'm telling you guys, I'm telling you people that want to judge me, and judge people and judge Ravi Zacharias. You're throwing stones. He is guilty, but the same Messiah would have picked him up with all the stones. And he would have turned around to the people and say, you without sin throw the first stone. And is there really one of you listening to this? Is there really one of you without sin? Is anyone listening to this or reading this book without sin? Is any one of you living a sinless life? There's a lot of people that there's, I've met two apostles in the past who, who weren't sinning, who weren't sinning anymore. But those both apostles both admitted that they had sinned before. Is there anyone sinless? Can you cast a stone? Because this book is about stop throwing stones. And the problem with the church, and I'll get back to this chapter, is because we know that people are going to throw stones, no one admits their sin. And so their sins are hidden. And whilst the sin is hidden, it's got power. Whilst it's in secret, it's got power. Well, I've probably, producing this book, I've opened the door for the success I'm going to have in my healing. All I've got to do is uh, chase up the uh, sex addict line and God's going to probably open a way for me to get healed. But I had to go through this door of obedience. I had to produce this video, I had to share my heart with people and honestly believe we, we, we live in a culture where and I think the main issue here is there's no one to confess our sins to. 
people, those, those 50 percent of males that are addicted to pornography, have they told anyone? Is there any church, if, if you're a worship leader in a church, you're leading the worship. If you're the main worship leader at church, every week people enter into the presence of God because of how you sing songs. Who are you going to go to and say three times a week you're masturbating to porn? Who can you tell? And if you can't tell anyone and you can't get anyone to hold your hand and support you in this and get you free, if you can't meet your Jesus who says, neither do I condemn you, how can you ever get free? And this is the issue, folks. This is why I'm producing this video, I'm producing this book now, because I'm not a major name now. I haven't got a big reputation now. But one day in that third stage in my life that my mother talked about, one day if I'm this famous evangelist and I've got a big name, these sins will be in the past. And so it won't affect me. And people will really respect me because saying, well, you know, if you read his books from, from this date to this date, he was always talking about being uh, stuck with these sins and now he's not. And people are going to believe me. And if I ever fell in the future after I was healed and I fell again, people would understand. But folks, we have a culture of sin and we have a culture of abusers. We have a culture because our church doesn't want to hear. We can't tell anyone because people throw stones. People judge. And another thing, another thing why sin is so rampant with leaders is that we put these people on pedestals. We have like our own Hollywood when it comes to the ministry. And that's fine for us to have heroes and have people on pedestals. It's like a natural thing that human nature has. They always have to look up to a hero. But how does that affect the person on that pedestal? If you're high and lifted up on this pedestal, who can you go to? Who can, you know, this Ravi guy, how could he share with someone that he's regularly sexually abusing girls? Who could he go to? He's this famous person in ministry. Who could he go to and confess his sin to and get help? And who could he go to that they wouldn't remove him from ministry? If, if someone is in ministry, like Todd Bentley was in ministry, for instance, and he got exposed two years ago. Todd Bentley was, ex, you know, sexually abusing his staff and he was for years. How could he in ministry on this pedestal with one of the most powerful ministries in the world, who could he confess to? Who, who could he go to on his staff or uh, reach out to another uh, leader and say, I've got this issue, I'm abusing my interns. He'd be taken out of ministry. He'd lose everything that's important to him. And because they're going to lose, because there's such a consequence to them confessing their sin, they never confess it. And so this, there's this uh, problem, there's this major problem with hidden sin in churches. And while ever we have a culture of wearing faces and putting on our putting our best foot forward and not being honest with one another. Christians just aren't honest. They just don't talk truth. You can get in an honest conversation about addiction to prostitutes in the pub within five minutes with a stranger. 
you, you can be talking to a stranger in a pub and say, I was seen a prostitute last night. Gee, she was a great kisser. And right away, the guy's talking to you. You can't say that in a church. You can't lean aside and a cup of coffee after church and saying, I was sleeping with this prostitute last night. Gee, she was a great kisser. I mean, he'd take you to the pastor and you'd get kicked out of the church. But the problem, here's the problem, guys. It's the pastor that's sleeping with the prostitute. Who can he tell? He's certainly not going to tell his wife. Can he tell his elders in the church? Can he tell his worship leader? It's not until someone comes forward. It's not until someone makes a video like this. It's not until some, uh, someone makes a video like that pastor that I put in the description tag. It's not until someone comes forward that people get free because suddenly thousands of people start saying, oh, i got that problem, i got that problem. Mentioning suicide, you know, there's been four times in my life I was going to kill myself and four times Jesus sent someone to save my life. But just mentioning suicide, just mentioning that you've been suicidal, Four times I had to be saved. Four times I was going to do it. Mentioning that, I don't have to say my answer to suicide. Just mentioning that I was going to be suicidal, that brings comfort to so many thousands of people. Mentioning that I was sexually molested, sexually abused on the beach, that brings comfort to so many people. Mentioning that, I've been homosexual and done homosexual acts. Brings comfort. Telling people that I'm addicted to prostitutes and I really enjoyed some encounters with some escorts. Brings comfort to people. Telling people that the only way I save money is masturbating. Uh, to, to many men, they'll understand that. Why does it take me? Why? Why? Why out of all the Christians in the world, why out of all the preachers in the world and all the therapists in the world, why has the Holy Spirit got me doing this video and producing this book? Why do I have to come forward and say it? Well, I know it's helpful for me. I know that uh, there's reasons that the Holy Spirit has got me doing this, but the church just hides their sin. Well, I've got nothing to lose, guys. I, I, I'm I, not getting invited to churches. I'm not preaching. I haven't got an international ministry. But I can tell you what, in five years' time, if I'm traveling the world as an evangelist, this book's going to have power. People, people from all walks of life are going to come and listen to me because they know I'm authentic. Because when I had an issue, when I was still struggling with an issue, when hundreds of people knew who I was, I was admitting my problem. Here I am, guys. If you've listened to this video and you're a therapist and you can help me, get in touch because I want help. So we're always going to have wolves. We're always going to have abusers because abusers are victims. Do you know? Do you know that nearly every abuser was victimized and abused themselves? And we can't get free of this pain until the pain is healed. And every abuser is a victim himself at some stage. I, you know, one time. I went to a massage parlor where there were trafficked women. When I went in there, the, the three girls that came into the room were shivering in the corner in fear. I knew right away that these girls had had their passports stolen and are getting forced to do this. I walked out of there. I said, I don't want to have any part of this. Every woman that I've been part of uh, has, has been 
hasn't hasn't been a slave. She's been given fifty percent of her income. Uh, it mightn't be like it is overseas in America. In Australia, prostitution is legal. I'm not saying that I'm any less guilty, but um, as far as I know, um, I've never been sleeping with a woman who who uh, was being forced to do it. And once again, see, here's the thing, it's really interesting to listen to me speak because that's another justification. She may have a drug problem and she's got reasons why she does it. No girl, no little six-year-old girl says to her dad, when I grow up, I want to be an escort. Girls don't think of that in high school that when I grow up, I want to become rich. I want to become an escort and earn $10,000 a week as an escort. Girls don't uh, do, uh, you know, vocational training on how to become an escort to make a lot of money. No girl decides that. So every, every girl in the sex industry, every woman working in the sex industry is a victim. And I fully embrace the fact, and I'll say it here, that I'm victimising these victims. But I'm saying I've spent enough time uh, doing this video so far. I'm, I'm appealing to you. I'm a victim too. And I want this healed. And I want this fixed. I said quite clearly that I felt like the king of the world when that escort agency was using me to victimize those girls and bring them into the ministry. I freely admit that, uh, that I was doing a bad thing there. And I freely admitted in the counseling session, the, the guy at Elijah House Ministry said that I was boasting. And because I've still got so much trouble and trauma that's got to be fixed in my life, I'll admit that you could watch this video and, and seem as though I'm boasting and I'm not repentant. And it may seem as though I'm making excuses all over the place, but I'm a really evil person. And you can throw stones at me because that's all you'll be doing. Because that's the answer that Christians have got. They just pick up the stones and throw them. But who's ever going to speak up for the victims? Who's going to ever speak for the abusers? You know, Jesus loves the abusers. Jesus come to set the captives free. And there's no more of a captive than someone who's abusing. You know, I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, pedophiles abuse the age that they were abused. If a man was sexually abused and raped between the ages of six and nine, that's when he sexually abused and rapes children between the ages of six and nine. I'm not sure if you understand this because we've got different people that are listening. But when you have certain amounts of trauma, your body splits and your spirit splits and you have altars. And I've got a whole lot of altars. And the pedophile, the pedophile only relates to that age that he's got a little child at that age within him. So he feels comfort and, and love and, and alignment with someone that age because he's got a little child in him that, that's age. So he only finds comfort having sex with a child at that age. And he's abusing the child, he's hurting the child, but that's all he's ever known in love because he was getting abused and raped at that age too. So in he's perverted and you can call it perverted you can call it sick or you can just say his neural pathways that are have been created in that 
He thinks he's loving that child. And you, you don't understand it if you haven't researched it, if you haven't looked at it, you haven't read those sort, that sort of information. Because are all the victims just victims? And all the abusers, predators and, and, and pedophiles and, and, and abusers. Because those little children grow up to be abusers, a certain percentage of them. Nearly every abuser was abused. Isn't he a victim anymore? When you become an abuser, were you ever a victim? And aren't you still a victim? We've got a mess. And one of the main problems with, with the church is that all the sins are hidden because we've got a culture of not confessing. And it's worse for people in spiritual ministry, like Todd Bentley's had a powerful ministry, is when they're in power and I've got people looking up to them, they're on a pedestal, who can they confess to? See, my advantage that I've got is I'm a nobody. I've got, you know, 50 or 100 people watch my videos and I've, I've got 150 people read one of my books and I've got a moderate following, but nothing like anyone else. So it's it was very hard. I've had a lot of warfare around this book. Um, I didn't want to, my flesh didn't want to do it. And, and you know, uploading this video and, and putting it live and producing the book is going to be a real act of obedience. I actually uh, got a prophecy that was given over my life that gave me the courage to go ahead and do it. But you can throw stones at me. Feel free. Feel free to throw stones at me. But my question to you is, have you got the answer for me? Because if you got the answer, I'd love it. I'd love it. So chapter 21 is stop throwing stones. So I got the title. Um, I've got a um, scribe angel. You may wonder how, how I could ever minister with angels and have angels around me. I'm such a bad guy but i've got a scribe angel which is an angel that helps me write and make videos she gave me this title stop Throw throwing stones uh, the anatomy of a christian sex addict she gave me the title she gave me all these chapter titles on this pad of paper you can't see it but she gave me the 21 subtitles uh, for the headings of the chapters, and it'll be 22, 21's like growing up, but there'll be an introduction in 21 chapters. Um, she gave me the title and the subtitles, and she's given me the courage to speak. But in the church, we, we need to stop throwing stones. Do you know, I haven't watched it because I didn't know Ravi, this Ravi guy. I didn't know him. I've never watched a video of him. He, he was a real hero. But people, I, I hear there's all sorts of debate of people saying, has he gone to hell and he's such a wolf and stuff. Do you realise that people throwing stones like that make themselves feel better condemning someone else? It was terrible. It I'm not diminishing what he did. And and please excuse me if you think I am. If, if, if you think I'm saying what he did was acceptable and we should just allow that, I'm not saying that that's right and that should have happened. But what I am saying, I'm trying to appeal to you and I've used my whole video and me explaining my whole life to get to this point. What I'm saying is he's a victim. And until we start fixing victims, we're always going to have abusers. See, the abusers will never stop while people are always being abused. 
while ever people are hiding their sins in the church, there's always going to be abuses. If your pastor who's seen prostitutes and got a porn addiction, if he saw this video, he may reach out to me and say, well, how do I get free? And if you're watching this and you're that person, I'd suggest you watch the video that um, I, in the book I will have said the title and follow that guy and chase him up. But you need to be free. You need to be free of the guilt and the condemnation and the secrecy. If, if you're watching this and you're a victim of pornography, if, if you're an addict of pornography and addict of prostitutes, tell someone, tell someone this week. One way you could tell Holy Spirit just spoke to me. One way you could tell them is uh, um, I, I want you to watch this video, then I've got something to tell you. And you could send them this video. They'll probably guess halfway through the video that you're one of these addicts. The church has got to stop throwing stones because Jesus didn't throw a stone at her. And he's qualified. He was without sin. Do you know, Jesus is still saying, neither do I condemn you. Ravi's in heaven. You know, Billy Graham was a 33 degree Mason. He's in heaven. We serve a Jesus who has got tremendous forgiveness. I was in a dirty massage parlor one time where they do a massage like Ravi's sin. They do a massage and, and, and then uh, masturbate you, give you hand relief. And I was just in one of those um, parlors and I left and I'm walking down the street with guilt and condemnation, feeling really bad. And about two minutes later, I passed a, like a little Chinese Asian little girl and she's about six. And I said to Jesus, she's really innocent. And Jesus said, that's how I see you. You're really innocent too. But I've just come out of abusing that girl. And I hadn't confessed to Jesus. I hadn't say, forgive me for that. I hadn't reached that stage of doing that yet. But in that point of sin, in that point of freshly have done my sin, I seen this six year old and just little children are just so innocent. And I said, she's so innocent. And Jesus said, that's who you are to me. You're innocent. If he sees me as innocent, who is someone else to condemn me? If the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the judge of the whole world, the, the word of God sees me as innocent, who are you to condemn me? And oh, if you can't set yourself free and nothing you can do can set you free. And you've got to be set free by the grace of God. How are you to blame for not being free? If it's going to take God to get you free and God hasn't got you free, how are you to blame? Because I've heard this prophet that I follow saying that Ravi was such a wolf and there's all this sin in, in the church and people are only allowed to do this when people don't hold them accountable and people shouldn't ignore sin if they 
get a sniff of it, they should expose it. Well, there's truth to that. But my truth is Ravi was a victim. And I'll say it again, and I'll keep on saying it. I'm not excusing his sin, I'm just saying he was a victim. And he'll meet the same Jesus that says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. But if we just forget the go and sin no more thing, because the guy who wasn't guilty of doing anything, and he, he, he was uh, at that pool through no fault of his own and no fault of his parents, no sin that he did or no sin that his parents did. He was there all those years just for Jesus to heal him and for Jesus to be glorified. Why did Jesus say go and sin no more to him? So I want to repeat, when, when you say neither do I condemn you, but you've got to stop sinning, you're throwing stones. And I'm not saying you've got a license to go and keep on sinning. What I am saying is, hey, I want to stop. And I've been humbled and finally going to chase down this path to, to go to sex anonymous, whatever, sex addicts anonymous. Because I've been convinced by this video that I need help. And part of my life was I thought that I, I could get through this myself. It took the six months being free and falling back into it to get me to a stage saying, well, not even the grace of God can fix me. I need my brain to be rewired. And my friend in um, the prophecy that I just heard quoted Romans 12, 1 to me that being transformed by the renewing of my mind is the exact verse that talks that my mind has got to be renewed. And it's what the guy was talking about in the video that uh, it's got to be rewired. So I can see my path ahead of me. Can you see your path ahead of you? I want to encourage you for reading this book. I want to encourage you for watching this video. There is an answer. And I, I know if you got to this stage and you've watched this video and you haven't got the answer yet and I haven't provided the answer. I know it's dark and it's lonely and sad, but I know this, Jesus loves you and you are forgiven every time you bring your sin to the Lord and you say, sorry, you're forgiven. Like a little starving kid. He's starving. He goes into the shops and he steals food because he needs to eat. He can be caught and have his hand cut off in some nations, but he's still a victim. He's starving. And we're just that little kid. Us victims, us, us addicts, we're just going into the fruit shop stealing food. We can't stop. And I tell you that I recognize the, the, the main issue is the problem with hidden sin in the church. So do me a favor, if you're listening to this video, if you're reading this book, tell someone today. If, if you're not a member of YouTube, which means you can't comment, write to my email address. My, my website is in the description tag under this video. 
if you watch this video and you're not a member of YouTube, write to my email address and write to me and tell me that what sin, what, what addiction you've got and just confess to me. If you're reading this book, write to my email address and confess to me. If you're watching this video and you're a member of YouTube, confess what sins you're doing and just do that. Just do one confession, do a private confession to me. But better still, if there's a friend in your church, if there's someone in your church, there's someone you know, confess to someone real. Let them know this problem. And, and after that, you can show them this video and say, this will give you more understanding of my problem. Here's a person who was really real about it, someone that was really transparent, someone that struggling himself that even... Even talking about it, he, his eyes are filling with tears. I haven't got answers, guys, but you need to stop throwing stones.